everyone, and welcome to the best crossover in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I am joined today with West End best friend, Duncan Burr and James Edge. How are you guys? Hello. How are you doing? Woo-hoo. Yeah, I'm all right, babes. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, especially after the news that I've just received. Uh, Theatre is coming back, apparently. <sighs> it is. What are your thoughts on that? Because I've sent you the uh, article this morning, Duncan. Um, I mean, I'm... The, the, the only issue, obviously, I'm happy. It's just the issue that we've all had from the start of these things is it's like, my mate had it yesterday. It's like, beauty salons can open from Monday. She's like, great, give, like, <laughs> I can't just open now. Do you know what I mean? It's the yeah. fact that the government always say these things can happen, but they always give a date that's like three days time away mm. or something like that. They don't give anyone an, an amount of time. Recently, it feels like no one's had an amount of time to prepare. So, so I'm happy that theatre is open um, and open air theatres are coming back. It would have just been nice to have a bit of forewarning so that people could get stuff ready to put out. Yeah. But it's very exciting. Um, and I think um, Regent's Park Open Air will, will release a statement being like, look, we're doing everything we can to make sure that we can kind of give someone something. Yeah, I mean, because... <laughs> Open Which, Air Theatre at the Regions Park, I think, was going to be the first one that was going to open because earlier on in the week, the government said that open air spaces can be used to perform. Yeah. So it's nice because we've got, like, gigs and stuff, which I'm sure people are preparing. But it's just sad, like, because you've got places like the Globe that can't, that can't open because it's still not economically viable for, like, mm. places to open at the moment, which is... Which is upsetting. Everyone which... can just do a, a rendition of Midsummer Night's Dream. It's fine. Sorted. My God. Yeah, literally. <laughs> all, we do, all we need is seventy-five productions of Midsummer Night's Dream because I think yeah. everyone yeah. will just go because everyone's yeah. so desperate <laughs> to have some form of like normality. Just take any Shakespeare, make it like post-apocalyptic, and find some soil exactly. and just ride around in the mud like pigs. Yeah. It'd be great. So you know the, art, the, the article read, so it says, Court Secretary Oliver Dowden announced the changes this uh, evening after admitting earlier this week he would love to see Pantos back. Mr Dowden said, this is an important milestone for our performing artists who have been waiting patiently in the wings, which is an understatement. We've been waiting for a very, very long time. <laughs> theater, um, theater. <laughs> <stay patient>? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, today's announcement brings the industry one step closer to performing indoors, but did not give a date for when they could expect to restart the thing is that that coincides of what we've been saying like there hasn't been a date like they've, they've said oh yeah theaters can come back but we don't know when which is really really it's frustrating like, because it was like his five-step plan wasn't it mm. i mean it's all well and good having a plan but with a plan you need three part to slogan <laughs> <laughs> like um, gyms are going to be indoors do you know what i mean that's one thing that annoys yeah. me I mean, I'm, I'm kind of sad as it is because now I can't have that excuse of, well, I can't go to the gym and exercise because they're shut. I can't say that anymore because they're going to open again. Um, <laughs> but I think it's hard to know. Everyone's going to be, everyone's gonna be sweating away in the gym but can't go and sit politely in a the theatre. It just, you know. I mean, and I think that's the thing. It's because we've seen it with aeroplanes um, coming back in and everyone sitting side by side. I mean, I won't... This is the point that I'm at personally. I'm like, uh, if you, if aeroplanes are happening, if people are cutting people's hair, if gyms are reopening, we, we, measures can be taken and they've, uh, they've proven in Korea that it's effective. Um, I mean, even they've got like an effective track and trace app, so that thing works. Um, but they've proven that they can reopen theatre. Like there's, um, there's a guy that's on my a- agency books that's in the international production of Phantom and that's in Korea at the moment. And they've yeah. been back performances for weeks i think if you take the right measures um especially with like theme parks reopening it can be fine the issue that we've got in theater is actually not the audience it's the class because if you've got someone on stage that then develops symptoms of covid19 that's you've got the entire cast that have to self-isolate for two weeks yeah and that's the issue that we're still facing with theater um whereas six it's not so bad because um those six powerful queens can social distance on stage because we all know like six is is a a musical like rock concert Mm. but they they so they can do that so that's why that can be done however we are socially distanced 
six a <laughs> <laughs> um, and i think i think that's the issue that's um that's facing us at the moment is the um is us lot being on stage and it being okay because like sonia friedman said you can't really do romeo and juliet with romeo and juliet two meters away from each other the whole show and yeah. and that's that's the issue that we i think we've got at the moment but i think if we're in a position where open air theatre can can come back in what month are we in are, are we still in march 2020 because i feel like that's where we still are I um, feel like July? July? Which July? five years have passed um if we're in uh, at a point in july where we can like start open air i think by the time panto comes around we'll probably be able to do um indoor theater again the issue is is us not knowing yes, if that if if that's a thing that can happen because obviously theater works so far in advance that yeah. we just we don't know obviously pantos have already been cancelled and then like two days later that's when we get the government bailout <laughs> that's obviously. the thing i think the way um, i even heard that this was happening is that um a friend of mine pull up okay so i've got 48 hours to think of a production i can put outside any ideas and that's how i heard about it, it it's it's everyone's still it's still not great for theater but there's a lot of um production companies i know that they are solely outdoor theater companies so at least some of the people in our industry are able to get back to work now so it's small yeah industry, that's but... what and i hope um companies like immersion because immersion do a lot of um open air theatre so i hope that they'll be able to be back because it's a it's it's a, everyone's businesses and livelihoods and we all know how, oh, God, being yeah. ourselves how many people have been affected by this lockdown i mean we all, there was like that huge list that came out on Facebook that was never ending when someone was like, when you're watching Hamil Hamilton, just remind um, remind yourself of what is happening. And it goes down to the fact that they're, they're, there's um, there's a cobbler's that's out of work because they're the person that fixes the shoes that we wear as actors in shows. There's um, a drivers that are out of the work, out of work because, um, because a star name gets a drive. Do you know what I mean? It affects everyone. There are so many people that are affected. So it's nice to see that although not everyone can get back into the industry, at least. Do you know, I never thought of that actually. And that's actually the bigger picture. Like it's, it's not just theatre, it's the businesses that coincide with it as well, that make the costumes, make the wigs. Like you said, the cobblers who make the shoes. It's that Dress as well. Seamstresses, like it's ridiculous. Like projection designers, lighting designers, everyone that works for them to create those the yeah. things that we have mic companies people um, don't understand it's a whole conglomerate theaters not just people dancing around the stage there's such a huge mm -hmm. huge conglomerate of it did you see the video i saw a video the other day that was really interesting it was a woman uh, she had like a little tea candle uh in her hand and she, the video was her showing the difference between whispering and singing and how much breath you get off so and she was like whispering is uh, worse for you and like the candle instantly blew out and while she was singing the candle just didn't even move <laughs> yeah and i think that's that's really impressive um but also conversely the issue with that is is there's a lot of inhaling involved in singing <laughs> yes yeah, exactly. i didn't think about that fireball <laughs> So, so obviously when you inhale, you don't necessarily blow the candle out, but you do inhale oxygen, CO2, yeah. and potentially like COVID. So, there, so I do get that video and I get what she's saying, but also there's, there's a lot that goes into it, but I just, I do want it back. The thing is, if you take all the right measures, there's no, no reason if other things can happen, they can't, which was my biggest bugbear with, for example, someone being able to get their hair cut dressed in PPE and someone not being able to have their nails done yeah. because you're, yeah. you're closer to someone's mouth when you're cutting their hair than you are when you're you're doing their fingernails and nail technicians wear a lot of PPE anyway because of the fumes that they have to deal with um so it's just that there's been no consistency it's like one rule for one people one rule for another and I feel like that's the constant snowball of this whole situation yeah something that really annoyed me the other day as well I don't know if you saw it I think I retweeted it uh, I retweeted a picture of uh, the day that the pubs opened 
and everyone was so not the greatest at social distancing let's say that because i won't no. say anything i won't say what i really think about it uh, yeah. <laughs> but it was that picture uh, that was taken from a height oh, where you could see Mary Poppins, uh, the Prince Edward. Oh, is that Soho, was it? Or where yeah, was it? It, was, it was in Soho. Great. And I'm thinking, what a shit picture that is. Yeah. yeah. Just, it's not ideal. And I mean, I just think <laughs> the government are like, we, we trust in the British public to do the right thing. And... When Brits are drunk, we don't do the right thing. Like, and I think that's evident. With things like marches, yeah. protests, pretty much everyone, I would say a strong 90% of people who took part in the protests were, were wearing face masks. Um, I think and you don't have that when people are, are drinking in the street, not social distancing. Yeah. And that's the thing. The core reason of that is no, that people feel, they feel jaded because we're clearly the bottom of the government's priorities as the arts whereas the arts have been so essential to people's mental health to people's entertainment during lockdown we've been the first thing that people turn to in time of the crisis but the last thing that gets addressed and the help that it needs and i think that's why people feel jaded yeah and it kind of feels like i think adam lenson said this the other day on twitter it um like the bailout is amazing but it's kind of like, at the moment... Yeah, it's it's only 1% of, of what the arts make. Yeah, anywhere. it's putting a plaster up, like putting a plaster on a leaking pipe <laughs> at the moment, because it's all well and good to say you've got this incredible world-leading package. And it is, it's brilliant. Like, But we need to see where that money goes, and we need to see how that money is money is used and whether it's going to the right places. Like, So it's incredible that we've got it, and we're so thankful because the industry <laughs> start surviving again. But it's really essential to know that the money is going to the yeah. people that need it and the theatres that need it. Yeah. And it's just having it because you've had places like the Nuffield and Leicester Haymarket that have gone under. Can those be saved? Will the money allow another theatre group to buy those theatres and keep them open? Or, or, or is that it? Are they going to become a bloody weather spoon? It's like watching someone die from dehydration. And then once they finally die, throwing them in the ocean and going, water! You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh my Thanks, god, guys, cheers. Do you know when you just said the, the leaking pipe? My mind instantly went to the meme. If you know the that pipe that's leaking, and then the guy just slaps that bit of tape on, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's like 1.57 billion. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true, it's so true. Like, I mean, I, mean, I, I sound a bit pessimistic, I'm not, I'm like so thankful, and we're all so mm. thankful that we've finally yeah. been seen. But conversely, it shouldn't have taken us shouting and having to go, Hey, Huns, we put like the, the West End alone makes one billion dollars a year, and us doing theater, 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 hashtag Oliver Dowden for for these things to have taken so long as they have done because yeah. obviously a lot of people have have been affected the, the nationals had to make 400 people redundant um the royal exchange in manchester announced that if they didn't get funding thankfully they have but they were gonna they could have made up to 65 percent of their staff redundant yeah and that's yeah. A, that's a lot of people and then you have the people who so you have that 35% then that they would have also been on a pay cut doing 65% of people's work. So then it comes down to the stress and that like that, that would have had on the people working on the theatre to get it back. And it's not an easy fix either. Theatre have lost millions. Um, and it, like it costs 30,000 to keep a West End theatre just, just there for a week with nothing happening. Do you know how uh, much it costs to keep Wicked afloat for a whole year? This oh, is God, just this is just wicked. It's thirteen million. I found that out this morning, and I'm just like, so that's just one musical. Let alone yeah. that's just one show itself. One point five seven billion. How long is it before that runs out? Before we need something else? It's just going to be a quick turnaround for for London. I think London's going to be the slowest turnaround. I think into next year. I think all of a sudden we're going to realise just how important and precious our regional theatres are. Um, and they deserve 
the funding what as well terrifies me about us not being able to have panto because we all know that the the, the regions make their money off of there aren't many um regional houses that do internal productions you've got like sheffield crucible lesser curve nottingham playhouse um like the watermill um other pl there aren't that many but there are so many regional theaters and so a lot of them make their income off of touring productions or panto panto is the rest like, of their year like 60 percent of their yearly income is from panto yeah. and so that's 40 percent that is like um these are equated figures they're not accurate <laughs> not <laughs> duncan figures <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> but you know this is a, it's a roundabout and that's so so that's 40 percent of the year that was instantly instantly gone because everything has been rescheduled to next year in the coming years like the, everything's been suspended tour wise so that's 40 percent already gone and then you think of something like somewhere like wolverhampton grand who's who's had to postpone cinderella that's essentially a hundred percent of their income is yeah. gone like yeah. for the whole year, that's a hundred percent. So how are they possibly supposed to stay afloat to be able to do that? Before to market their shows, let alone anything else going forward. Nicely, and 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 that's just one theatre. Like you got you the Birmingham somewhere... Hippodrome as well. Yeah, you look at somewhere like ATG. ATG owns something like thirty-nine theatres across the UK. Ten of them are like eight to ten of them are in the West End. That's still yeah. 20 theatres that their income is based off, not in taking the ones into account that are in New York or Germany or other places, but that's 20 regional theatres that, that is their business. And that's, that's tw individually, that's 20 re regional theatres that, that need and then help. you have the small theatres, the beautiful little small theatres that live yeah. in the pubs and stuff like that, that are gonna struggle so much. You have like Southwark Playhouse, up, upstairs at the Gatehouse, Above the Stag, Hope Mill, like you have um, old joint stock. Um, it's just, it's there. There's so much more that people realise, and I think people are obviously scared. We're all scared. London will bounce back, and but it will take a long time. And that's we the sad thing. We need that's to really focus so good on um, on our regions because that's because people can't afford to go to London all the time. And that's where people, like we're all from the Midlands. Where was our first experience from theatre? Mine was going to Malvern each year to see the Panto. Do you know what I mean? Mine was um, Wolverhampton Grand, yeah. Wolverhampton Grand. And you, so you don't go to London, you go to your regions, but what, what, what are we gonna do? What's that for the next generation of actors who are inspired to be actors because of the theatre that they go and see as a child? Um, like if the theatre can't be saved, and then that's the thing that if we did, we hadn't got the money by November, seventy percent of the theatres in this country would have just been like, bye, because yeah. they couldn't afford to. So it's incredible that we have this amount of money, but we need to use it well because this is a situation that can't be brushed under the carpet. It's not like, oh, we've got the money now, let's forget about the arts. It's no, we've got the money now, let's all work together to yeah. make sure this industry survives and thrives. 2019 was such um, a fantastic year for theatre. I oh think God. the West End, did we, did we gross more than Broadway or something? It was something ridiculous. We, we hit some kind of achievement in the West End and to have such a hide then for this year to just absolutely plummet. It's crippling, isn't it? And it's, it really it's, is. as, as performers, it's, it's not just the theatres as well, it's the performers thinking you've worked so many years since graduating to, to make your contacts, um, move to the next platform. And it feels like everyone's just tumbled back downhill now. Um, yeah. yeah, completely. And you have your plans, don't you? Yeah. Like of what you want to achieve and what you succeed as an actor. And it's, and it's we all know that this career is a big part of it is momentum. So like yeah. once you've got the momentum, you want to keep the momentum. And now um, I was saying to Perry on the live earlier, it's just like 2020 is a, a big pause. It's just like the pause button has been hit, but we don't know what's the, like the rest of the film isn't the other side. <laughs> 20, 20, 20, 20. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Just think like what the timeline has been from the moment lockdown happened on March 20th to now, like, we, so I thought, oh God, this is it now. Like theatre is gonna, gonna absolutely crumble. But we have come a long way since then. Oh my God, we've gotten so wet, and then so many people are doing amazing things. What the national has done, um, and coupled with 
coupling places with like the Dunmar and the Young Vic and the Bridge to bring out um, their their productions that they had. Things like um, Mercury Colchester being able to put out um, pieces of string. Stuff like that has been an absolute saviour. The Barn is, and yeah. that's a theatre that needs needs saving as well in the region. It's the Barn. Um, and Hope Mill have just put out these, uh, put and are putting out, continuing to put out concert upon concert because, and because, yeah, they, they need saving, they need to make money, but theatre needs to thrive and we need it for ourselves. Performers need it to perform, but performers also need it to know that it's there and that it exists because the reason we do it is because we love doing it, but it's because we were affected by it in the first place. Yeah. Something I wanted your guys' opinion on as well. Going back to the fact that um, if we had to have open-air theatre, what musicals on the West End that haven't done Regent's Park open-air would you like to see there? Oh, my God. Have they, they done think? Rent? They haven't done Rent, have they? I don't no, they know. Have... Rent would rent be fine open-air. I mean... Get the scaffolding out, snick some from that road. I mean, I think they're... Their production of JCS for me is the definitive production of Jesus Christ Superstar. Like, I don't see how anyone could do a better production than that. Uh, but please try, because I love that. Um, but that's proof that they can do, like, insane things. And, like, do a rock musical in such an insane way. I think, I'd love to see, um, selfish, I'd love to see a revival of Into the Woods. Because, oh, yes. although that's available on Broadway HD, I think that production is just absolutely stunning and is um and is something that could could be done there but oh what productions could they do i would like to see uh oh. one of lin manuel miranda's masterpieces uh, in the heights at the opening yeah, in the heights would do really well there i tell you what would be beautiful actually uh once on this island <gasps> oh nice. such once a shout regent's park open air would just be stunning Providing the weather was right. Could you imagine a hot sunny day? When I saw Ragtime at Regent's Park Open Air, like, I nearly died from the heat. Yeah. Um, do you imagine seeing Once on this Island in heat like that? Oof, that'd be absolutely beautiful. I'd yeah. love to see that. I think that would be a really great production. I think anything that is nature-focused, obviously, is a winner for somewhere like Regent's Park, which is why when they did A Midsummer Night's Stream, that was also stunning. Have they done uh, Children of Eden there? Oh. No, that's a great shout. They did it at the Union a couple of years ago. Mm. Um, but Children of Eden isn't done much, and I think that would be a great show. Love Children when, of Eden. Whenever anyone asks me what show I want to see, and I don't care that this is absolutely nothing to do with the outdoors, I'm always just like, Parade. Do another revival parade. of Parade. Parade. Yeah. yeah. Always do a revival of always, Parade. Always, 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 always. Parade and Red. And am I like, yes, parade. I'll go and see you, wherever you are. Um... I think you're in town would be really good at reaching. Oh, Park. yes. I think they'd be able to do a killer production of your. It's in a town. privilege to act. Yeah, it, <laughs> it is. It is. Do you know? Because you in town takes place outdoors anyway. Like in the whole musical, I don't think it ever takes. I mean, it, some scenes are in Cladwell's office, um, but really, like, I don't think there's any scenes other than that that are indoors. Really, um, now. I know that Duncan's knowledge is quite something when it comes to West End and theatre. But actually, James, I don't know what your knowledge is like. So actually, <laughs> I'd like to test that out right now. Now, this, if you've watched the Chattercake podcast before, you will know that we play a game called On the Nose. Now, are you guys familiar with it or not? I purposefully haven't watched so that I knew just to see what it was so that I feel like there's no way that I could put any that I could cheat or put any like parameters on myself um so that's why otherwise I know what I'd have been like and if I knew what it was like I could have just like researched, researched. <laughs> and I would have been like super affected. but now I'm just gonna be like so super relaxed in the moment uh, I thought my music was good like, well yeah. let's test it out guys because it's time to play Oh, oh, no. No. All right. So, so I feel like Duncan's going to know all these. So do I no, get? No, probably get... won't. This is what happens when I'm put under pressure. 
<laughs> so I'll just explain how this works. So I'll be asking a question all related to the fabulous West End, um, but it's a question based on a statistic. So it could be the date of something, how much something costs, etc. So whoever gets the closest to the correct answer will get one point. But if you're on the nose and you get it bang on, you get two points. Okay. Okay. All right. First question. According to the Tinternet, Les Mis is the longest running musical in the world, but what is the exact number of performances it has had on the West End? I put 15,000. What you put, James? I, I put 9,000. I can reveal. The answer is 13,964 performances. So the point goes to Duncan Bird. Duncan, you <laughs> maths. One nil. <laughs> the Duncan. All right, next question. Now, you've said this in this episode already. So, oh um, it's just whether you're going to get on the nose or not. And I think you might, or one of you might. All right, the next question <laughs> is How many West End theatres are operated by ATG? Can I answer first? If you've got it. Do you say West End or just theatres in general? West End. How many are on the West End are operated by ATG? Eight. Duncan? <sighs> Ten. Ho oh, ho! On the nose, Duncan. You get two oh, points, mate. my second answer. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad writing this next question because it's sort of a, as a, a disadvantage to James. On uh, anything to do with musical theatre, I'm going to be at a disadvantage. <laughs> it's fine. That's why I hire he'll Duncan. He'll probably like... get this question right now. All right, the next question is, the full Monty opened at the Prince of Wales Theatre, but what is the maximum seating capacity of the Prince of Wales? Which is where Mormon is now. I'd like to specify yeah. that I've seen Duncan in this and you in this, but I saw all of Duncan in this. Because <laughs> when everyone stripped at the end, I was like, I have to choose someone to look at before the lights go out. So I was like... I'm oh, Duncan yeah, I saw, I, saw a load, I saw all of Duncan as well because yeah. I, was, I, I was sat the thing was, the way on the side was... of the stage. The way it's directed, if you were on the sides, which is Reese and myself, then um, it it didn't really matter at the end. You definitely no. saw everything. No. So I kind of made that piece with myself. <laughs> right. What are your answers for this question? You go first, Duncan. 1,100. I wrote 1,500. Ah, oh, Duncan, mate. If you had put 1,160... You would have got the point. You got have got the two points, but you get a point anyway because yeah. you were closest. I thought yeah. you were about to be like, "Ah, oh, Duncan, you were wrong for once," but oh. you weren't. Right. So the current score is four nil. <laughs> All right. Next question. The producers holds the record for most one Tony awards, but how many Olivier awards did it win in two thousand and five? Duncan knows this kind of stuff. No, I won't. No, I genuinely don't know the answer to this. My, my, my brain saying go big or go home, James. Come on. I'm going to go five. I went say, low. What are you going to say, Duncan? Well, I was going to say five, so I'm going to say six now because I can't say five. Uh, and my second James answer was gets be the seven. point! James gets yes. the point! It's three! Oh, I didn't get the... I thought I got it on the nose then. I got overexcited. No, Damn it. it was three. Right, next question. Now, we've been talking about the open-air theatre. But what year saw the rebuild of the Regent's Park Open Air Theatre? Because it had a rebuild. It opened in 1932, but then it had a rebuild. What year was said rebuild? Duncan go first. 96? James, what are you saying? Uh, 2002. Ooh. The correct answer is 1999. Ooh. Oh, or do we both get that? Is that yeah. slap back in the middle? Is that equidistant? It is. <laughs> it is, is it? Is, is it? Have you both yes. got the same sort of... Yeah. Yeah. Side to side. yeah. All right. So, you both, both, get get a po point. both get a point for that one. I mean, if in doubt in life, I'd say round it up. But, you know, who, yeah, who's sure, counting? Sure, who's sure, 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 sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Final question. At the Theatre Cafe in London, how much is an Americano in Paris? Great pun. Really good pun. Oh, they, um, have, the, they have the best puns. I'm going to go 395. 260. 
The correct answer is £2.20. So Duncan gets Bargain. the point and is our winner of this week for On The Nose. Hey. Hey. <laughs> nice. Oh, I can breathe easy now. I won. <laughs> I mean, you should have. Yeah, it would have been, a, it would have been weird if you didn't win, to be honest, Duncan. I'm so disappointed with myself. You would have slept <laughs> uneasy for a few weeks. I yeah. really would have. That would have had a large effect on me. <laughs> Honestly, James, when we've had uh, Monty Mondays, where we do um, a quiz night with the cast of the full Monty, honestly, Duncan, how many times do you win? I say you win like 95% of the time. I So I didn't win the one that I hosted. Obviously, um, yeah. I, I lost Alex it. I didn't, well, I didn't lose, I came second. Um, I didn't win Alex. I've only not won three. Yeah. I've came, I've came, I've came last like a number of times, and we've been doing them ever since lockdown began. We haven't, done one. we haven't we haven't done one in a couple of weeks. No, Brad did this killer round. Um, the, the question ten of the Pixar round was name every single Pixar film, and, and the year they were released. <laughs> as well. The year they were released. So that so it was a point each. The whole thing. All I got wrong was the year that Monsters University was released, wow. and I think that's my proudest moment. Hey, do you know history. what? When I read the answers out and I was going through them with you, I was severely impressed. Because I, anyone that's watched the Chat Cake podcast before, me and Aiden did talk about the fact that my useless talent is the fact that I can name every single Pixar film that has ever been released and the year that they came out. <laughs> I love that. That's like, very... me. that's like me with Best Musical Winners at the Tony Awards from 2000 onwards. Yeah. Like, Duncan, we should try this with him. We should we should give him three that he has to shoot five at right now, recorded on Zoom. Go on, my God. Go on. Go on. Three questions. Three three Pixar films. He's claimed that he can name them like this. Oh right, okay. okay. Uh, I've done I've done this before. I've done this before. So okay. let's see let's see if I can do it. Inside Out. 2015. Correct. Okay. <laughs> um, is it? 2001. I thought that was a relatively easy one. Um, past three. Come on, oh, it's, it's, it's this era. It's this era of Pixar that I keep getting wrong. I'm it's past three onwards. I am, I am going to get this wrong. I am going to get this wrong. Ah, oh, bastard. <laughs> Cars 2 was 2011. Cars 3 was... I've got the answer here. 2017. Yeah. Yes! You got it. Okay. I got it. Right. I got it. See, that, 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 that's that why is... I did it, because I was like, I'm going to go for that really weird, annoying era, which is like post Cars 2. It is. That is such a weird like, era for Pixar. Weird. It's so weird. But I love them anyway. Oh, my God. Love Pixar. Oh, I watched something on Disney Plus the other day. It was um, Coco live in concert at the Hollywood Oh, Bowl. that's so cute. It's I amazing. That. It's when so grandma good. starts singing "Remember Me," when grandma, when an old person sings, anyone anyway, like, <laughs> I love the fact that Pixar musicals are a thing because obviously only exclusively at Disney parks or cruises. Uh, we talked about this before uh, on the podcast, but like something that we'd really like to see is like more Disney musicals because they are so beautiful and they're so magical. Like, have you seen Frozen Two yet? Yeah. Do you think that would work as a musical? Yeah, I do. I think because I think the score is exceptionally strong. Yeah. I think that personally, my personal opinion is the the songs that they've written for Frozen Two um, are far stronger, mature, and more complex than what they wrote for for, for Frozen. Which were, which which is clever because that's what Frozen Two is. It's a it's a mature film, and it's like the they uh, try to age it with it, the, yeah, the original it's, people, it's, haven't they? Yeah, we've clearly all watched the making of Frozen 2 on Disney Plus. We're all here, like, with our knowledge. <laughs> um, but I think it's brilliant. And I think, um, and Show Yourself is a better film than Into the Unknown, don't at me. Um, but I think, yeah, across the board, I think it's brilliant. And um, Something's Never Changed is just such a beautifully joyful number yeah. as well. Like, and, and that's what a really cute opening number should be. Um, and I was thinking about this because sequels are never, musical sequels are never like really done or when they are, they're never really well received. So <laughs> Love Never Dies. <coughs> Love Love King 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 King. King. Actually, 
Love Never Dies, I'm a massive supporter. Of nah, I mean, Till I Hear You Sing is the only bop from that show, really, in my opinion. God, Beneath a Moonless Sky, Beauty Underneath, there's absolute mm. bangers in that show. Actually, no I, will, no, I will agree with that. I think it's just the plot itself. I think, and this is my personal opinion, if it wasn't Phantom and it still had the same score, people wouldn't complain. Going back to musicals that you'd like to see on the stage, I know they have been on the stage now, but two Disney musicals that I need to come to England. Um, I want to see the, the Hercules musical that, that they did. Yes, please. Um, come and of course, it. I know the Royal Welsh did it, but I want to see Hunchback on the West End anywhere. I need to just go and see Hunchback. Yeah. So I know. Paper Mill Playhouse. I know you Paper did. Mill. Yes, it's just that's... the best. That is incredible. That show is is flawless. The and most underrated it. Disney film of all time. Oh, as completely, well. completely. And it's just there. I could honestly do a TED talk on how fantastic that film is, um, in all of its messages and the complexity of its score. Um, but the yeah, and the say show is just equally yeah. equally stunning. I think it's about um, Hunchback as well. It's, I saw a, a Facebook post, it was like a, and it was a Twitter thread as well. It was um, people saying, I want a Disney film where um, the main character isn't uh, made out to be this beautiful person. Uh, and they're like, Hunchback. I'm not it's familiar. literally, <clears throat> it's got everything. It's everything that people want and it's already there. Yeah. Like, yeah. it is brilliant. And it's so good. It's so good. And I want to see, like... I want to see Tarzan and Little Mo I just want us to have the shows that, <clears throat> that Broadway has had because I think Little Mermaid's a great score as well. Um, and there are so, so many potentials. Did you and see I, I, Aladdin I, on the West End? Because I didn't get to I see have. it. I had a mixed bag. I had a real mixed bag. I saw it on Broadway and in the West End. Do you know, do you agree with me when I say this? The fact that it works on Broadway because they don't have, they don't really know the element of panto. They don't have pantomime over there. And I, think, and I think it works over there because they don't have that and we do. So yeah, they don't a do lot of panto. And I think that's it's the issue. Like Aladdin's such a huge panto that we we've grown up yeah we've grown up with a film but we've grown up with this idea of aladdin being put on stage in this way so i yeah. think in the uk it's we people had that um that issue of viewing it through the lens of a panto because that's really all they we've known as aladdin on stage um because that didn't happen in new york yeah and and like for me because I w and I experienced that as well when I watched it in Broadway. I was like, the show isn't panto, but there's something about seeing Aladdin on stage and <clears throat> and having, for example, Jafar's scenes in front of the cloth sometimes mm. that is obviously very homage to panto, but yeah. that's just coincidence. Um, so I, so I found it very strange because in my own head, I was like, oh, this is weird. Like seeing something that I've actually, uh, a panto that you see so many times. And I think that's, I think that's what a lot of people were like, oh, it's just a panto. And I'm like, no, it's not. Like, no, it's, it's actual Disney it's, it's theatrical a, it's production. Music, but we're used to seeing Aladdin in no other way on yeah. stage other than that. Am I right in thinking there was no Abu, no Yago? Um, no, know. Yago was there. There was no Abu. No. Uh, because initially in the film, Aladdin had three mates. Yeah. And they got cut and Abu got added. So basically, they just cut Abu and added the three mates back. And so, like, um, the song Omar, um, Babkak, and Kasim, that was already written for the film. They just never oh, okay. used it. Um, so they were like, whoops, slide that one in there. They also wrote that. Proud of Your Boy for the film as well. Yeah, and that finally finally got on stage which yeah. annoyed me about the live action film because they didn't even put it in i Come on I, don't know. I don't know what to make of the live action film purely um, because i think in my opinion i feel like even though they're great i feel like the live action disney films are just being a little bit forced and a little bit like we're doing this 
because we started to do it and now that's becoming a trend and yeah now we're starting everything. to release a lot i mean what are they doing uh, what are the ones that they're doing that have been in the world i mean i land? think new land yeah new land, hercules is coming but i i love hercules so and hunchback's it, coming it, yeah if danny devito isn't philatiti so i'm gonna be like no he is philatiti yeah yeah well i think they'll bring him back for phil because they have to um i think what i want to see are uh, one the films that weren't that successful that are good that could be done as live action because a live action black cauldron one of their black biggest cauldron, flops, their big, terrifying yeah, yeah it's their biggest like flop financially commercially critically they invested yeah. so much into <clears throat> it as well and i love the black Time. cauldron like yeah it's intense for kids like really intense but if they're going to use this opportunity to realize things why not realize the ones that didn't work that much that well the first time round instead of um remaking the ones that landed mm -hmm. i mean because I, I i liked beauty and the beast but for me personally i was like if you're ever going to do a musical live action vers version of beauty and the beast it has to be the whole broadway score yeah and it wasn't like, it wasn't. There are so many good songs that they could have got. And I think all the songs that they added were nice. I think they're bad. I think they're very good. But I think that for me personally, my dream of the Beauty and the Beast film was literally take the Broadway score and book and everything because it's just perfect and put it on a film. Mm. That's all I wanted. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't really get that. But I did think it was good. What I got, what I was happy with. But I would have just preferred, like, like, there's that bit when Belle walks into her room and you hear a refrain from home in the score. I'm like, get her to sing it. She's already yes. singing. She's already proved that, you know, she can get by singing. Just get her to sing home. And yeah. <clears throat> if someone had, if someone had to, uh, like, yeah. if I had the choice of three animated classics that I'd love Disney to do a live-action remake of, uh, one, The Rescuers, Oliver and Company. Yes. Uh, oh my god! What was the other one that I, that I just thought of? Uh, Pinocchio. Okay, they are doing. I feel like they're doing Pinocchio. Are they? I didn't know that. Or Dumbo, they're doing. Pinocchio's going to scare some already, kids. Oh god, they've already done Dumbo. Dumbo <clears throat> was scary. Kids no, were like in, in the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. I mean, like as a stage musical, I think Dumbo's in development. Yeah. Oh, oh. really? Mm. Ooh. Puppetry's so good these days; it wouldn't surprise me. I know it'd be great. Oh, speaking of puppetry, has anyone seen The Grinning Man? Yeah, I went to see it at Tr Trafalgar Studios. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. The puppetry <coughs> in that is sublime. With the wolf it's and the little boy, uh, little grim pain. Oh, it's oh, it's amazing. The, I watched the live stream again at the Bristol Old Vic. Is it L Lewis Maskell? Is that his name or Louis? Louis Mas yeah, yeah, Louis, Louis Maskell. His Mascal, voice is one of the best voices Ooh. I've heard live. It was so eerie and so chilling, but so yeah. clean. <laughs> and he was in um, Flowers for Mrs. Harris as well, which Chichisha Festival released, which was just, oh, that was beautiful. Wept at the end. I heard it was great, and it's not getting a, not heard about a transfer yet, has it? No, it didn't get, like, and I, I wish, I hope. It was just such a gorgeously beautiful, original British musical. And as you know, they're like they're the ones that need to be homegrown. Musicals are the ones that really need to be supported. And just Claire Burt central. The fact that Claire Burt won't be able to be nominated for an Olivier for that performance is why it needs to be transferred, because her central performance in that show was just stunning. I hope they will release it again so people can watch it, or they put it on DVD. Please put it on DVD, Chichester. <laughs> I missed it, and I, I really need to. I've not, I've not been keeping up with all the lives. So many fantastic things have been released. I so missed Midsummer Night's Dream, and that's the one that I'm really livid about because Gwendolyn Christie is Titania. Come on now, that's oh, I love Gwendolyn Christie, and I missed it, and I'm like raging. Um, so have you guys got anything uh, coming up on West End Best Friend? Anything that you're releasing soon or anything, any projects you got lined up? Yes, yes, we have. Thank you for asking, Bradley. Um, <laughs> so well, we started three months ago and, and we wanted to create a bit of a positive vibe and buzz during lockdown. And so we started doing um, competitions on Facebook and then eventually on Instagram and Twitter. 
And the first one was uh, 60 pounds for 60 seconds. I did it as a bit of fun and it was getting judged by four um, musical theatre stars. Um, that went so well. We had hundreds of people apply that we so then good. did another one called um, 60 seconds to sing with a star, the Hamilton edition, because with Hamilton coming out um, to sing with Dumb Hartley Harris, who was a former George Washington. Nice. Then, then we've got our big one that we did called the oh, Unity it's a big Project. Game. Oh, it's a big one. Oh. Uh, the Unity <laughs> Project. Uh, and it's a charity single we're releasing to raise money for acting for others. Uh, and there were seven fantastic musical theatre vocalists on it. Dumb Hartley Harris, Alice Fern, Vicky Manser, Sophie Isaacs, Benjamin Perkis, Scott Hunter, and Nicola Mas Nic no, Nicholas, Nicholas, Nicholas McLean. And, um, <laughs> basically, we put out a competition saying we're looking for our eighth vocalist for it. We ran this big competition. Once again, hundreds of people applied. And we found a fantastic, very well-deserving winner in Fleur Davis. Um, and we are releasing that single Friday the 17th of July. Um, and then uh, hopefully after releasing the video, we'll be releasing it on Spotify on iTunes as well. And yes, we're hoping it's going to become a bit of an anthem for the industry during what has been a tough time. And there's lyrics in the song that literally say, just hold on um, because happiness is on the horizon. So that is coming out Friday the 17th of July. I love it's that. Really, yeah, it's really important. It's a really good song. Uh, James is being modest, he wrote it. Um, it's incredible. It's, it's a new anthem. It's a classic new age empty banger that everyone can get on board with, with seven and eight with Fleur. Like, incredible, incredibly different and beautiful vocal styles. Like, it's all, oh. it's incredibly talented. What everyone has been able to achieve um, and James and Adrian with mixing it all together is, in, in a lockdown environment is a testament to their talent, but also the proof that we ain't going to go quietly as an industry. Um, and I do think it is, it is a great song and it's a song that we all need right now. And it's just, the response to it has been incredible. Like the response from people submitting has been incredible because we were just essentially, James was a guy who wanted to start a page and wanted some help. So like, just I came guy. forward. It's just, just, he's just a small town guy from Red Hatch, just wanting to make his way in the world. Um, and yeah, we just, I think it's blown up beyond our expectations um so quickly like we expected it to get some traction but we expected that to be like a, a good like six months down the line or whatever and it's kind of working 50 percent ahead of what we th we thought it would be um and we've got a really like loyal band of besties which is really cute and um i've had a lot of friends text me saying oh i've i've seen loads of my friends just like sharing West End Best Friend articles and then like me someone who f who finds out news a lot and is obviously super geeky what I found thrilling is scrolling down my timeline and finding a new piece of information and then reali realizing that the article is actually a West End Best Friend article that one of my other friends has just shared yeah and like that's that's that for me was like oh my god this is s someone on my Facebook has randomly shared a link to like my business our business and it's just ridiculous um and really nice we've um, got about eleven thousand across all socials now and it's continuing to wow. grow um and, and i think you know when when lockdown happened and all the gigs everyone had got cancelled mm. um or and the theaters got shot i messaged three or four creatives that are new and trusted and i said you know i want to capitalize on the chaos um and i want to create something now while everyone's at home, while everyone's in lockdown, while they, some, they need something positive to look at um, to keep theatre alive in whatever little way we can. And I've got an idea for a song. Uh, well, I was writing a song called West End Best Friend, which was like this washed up actor that was bragging about all the creators they'd slept with. And they were like, my West End Best Friends and me. Um, and I was like, a catchy name, but maybe I'll make that into a brand instead of a song. <laughs> But yeah, and it's it's nice because it's a nice close knit team. There's um, there's like 
we've got a band of writers um, under Jenny's incredible, like, um, leadership as a journalist. She's just great. Like, um, Elle Knowles is just like social media queen. Tess, who's our gra graphic designer and she's done our rebrand and new website. She works with people like GQ and, and Vogue. And then like our digital legend, Wig, is just, he's cr he created the like initial website and everything out of like thin air and wow. then you've got james who's just relentlessly creating a page whilst working 40 hour weeks key um, worker. so it's very <laughs> key worker so it's very it's inspiring like as a member of that team to see all these people working so hard and dedicating so hard and that the whatsapp is always buzzing and it's always going and it's not just james being like oh hey guys i've got this idea for this or could you do this or, or could you do that it's not it's people talking to each other about things coming up people suggesting ideas it's nice to have a band that is, is a team it really is a team because people are working together and they, they want the page to be better it's not just that james has got a group of people that he feels like he has to like delegate to it's, it's running uh, itself now everyone has it, their, yeah. their things that they do everyone has their clear sections it goes to show in this industry more than anything i couldn't have started an accountancy firm and been like everyone jump on board we're all going to work for free but we're passionate about numbers and helping people with their taxes um let's go <laughs> um we're all passionate we're all performers in one way or creatives in one way or another and everyone has come together and made you know something that's fantastic already and achieved great things already and we've got to say, congratulations to you as well, Bradley, because you're doing exactly the same yeah, thing. Babe, yeah, babe, literally. During lockdown, you're creating something and, and you're, bringing, you're bringing creativity and, and art-related stuff to people's ear holes. So congratulations yeah. to you too. No, thank you, guys. I mean, you guys are slaying. Like, I mean, West End Best Friend was sort of the inspiration behind why we wanted to start this because we saw uh, <laughs> that, had, that you guys had started something and we were like, Yes, like this is the perfect time to be creative and to start something, and what a better time to do it. Um, so yeah, thank you for the inspiration, guys. Um, thank you for having us on. <laughs> oh no, yeah. mate! Lovely. Please, we need to do another one because I've loved recording with you guys. Because oh, I yes. love you so I love much. Um, yeah, let's do another one, and then maybe James can win on the nose next time. <laughs> maybe I'm gonna I'll, text, I'll text him all the answers beforehand, so it will make him look like he's won. I will pay you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unfortunately guys we are out of time today but thank you guys so much for coming on and doing the world's best collaboration absolute legend thank you so much for having us uh, no worries guys go and follow and subscribe to west end best friend because you will see so many great things coming from them uh, over the next coming weeks guys thank you again so much for coming on and chatting with me today thank you Thanks. so much Bye. have a good bye. day bye, bye.